All right, so we can get started. Um, once again, uh, welcome to our webinar today about a functional medicine perspective towards hyper and hypothyroidism. I'm Dr. Alexander McKillop, and I'll be leading this conversation today. First things first, a little bit about Aligned Modern Health. We are integrative medicine clinics, and so our treatment plans all aim to identify the root cause of somebody's symptoms so that we get that treatment plan right the first time and get our patients better right away. Um, we have a number of different modalities that we offer. Chiropractic medicine focuses on the musculoskeletal division, um, injury prevention, rehab, uh, back pain, arm pain, leg pain, the whole gamut. Uh, and they work very closely with our clinical massage therapy team um, to work out the muscle tightness, restore mobility of joints, and strengthen any imbalances that are identified. Uh, we also have acupuncture, which is uh, a modality from traditional Chinese medicine, often used for stress and anxiety disorders, pain, uh, as well as a number of other men's and women's health concerns. Really, if if it's a health issue, acupuncture can touch it. And then there's functional medicine, which is my wheelhouse uh, in tandem with clinical nutrition. And we look at all the internal medicine type disorders, GI health, autoimmune disorders, um, food sensitivities, nutrition counseling to understand what's driving somebody's symptoms and identify that root cause. Um, I am Dr. Alexander McKillop, um, so welcome. Uh, I have a particular interest in today's topic, uh, reproductive and other endocrine disorders um, like hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism. Um, I'm a functional medicine provider out of the Kildare office, so I see patients in person there as well as online throughout the state. So telemedicine has opened that up to really anybody who wants to come to Align. Um, and I also have an advanced training in GI health, autoimmunity, inflammatory disorders, uh, and blood chemistry and analysis. My favorite part of working with my patients is the relationship that I get to develop with them. So when you are doing that root cause medicine, there's a lot more detail that gets covered and that requires time and that time lends well to relationships. So I get to know my patients and then walk with them as they approach their health goals, which is an honor and a privilege. And then a little bit about functional medicine. So I touched on this briefly, but um, we are looking to identify that root cause uh, of a person's symptoms so that we're not just making a Band-Aid uh, diagnosis or a Band-Aid treatment plan to mask over those symptoms or shut down a division of a person's body. We want things to work the way that they were designed to work so that a person can feel their best. Um, we do that by using a variety of different diagnostic tools. So that can involve blood tests, stool tests, saliva testing, in order to get data to give us a full picture of a person's health. And we combine that with a very detailed clinical history. So I often will tell people at our first appointment, we're going to talk about your health history in more detail than you ever have. Um, and we then get a big picture about what is going on with that person's body. And then we can make a treatment plan that involves anything from nutrition and lifestyle modifications to herbs and supplements that are based on the evidence. Uh, and by evidence, I mean two things. One, that there's evidence in your test results that you need a given intervention. And two, evidence in the research that shows that the given intervention will bring about the desired effect. Then we track and manage um, those symptoms and that follow up those lab results to make sure that everything is progressing towards health naturally um, for our patients. And every so often there's a time for a referral for medication or surgery or a specialist as needed, but we try to limit the amount of times that our patients have to rely on those things. Of course, they have a time and a place for blessed to be able to use them, um, but we wanna reserve them for what they should be best used for. And that brings us specifically to how does functional medicine look at thyroid function and thyroid disorders? Um, starting with the basics, uh, what is the thyroid? Your thyroid is a small gland on the front side of your neck. Um, you can find it uh, by putting your hand gently on the, the front of your neck. And when you swallow, there's a little piece of cartilage called the cricoid cartilage that moves up and down. You might know of that as the Adam's apple, but women have them too. And the thyroid is found just about one or two finger widths below that. It's soft, spongy tissue, um, and usually you don't feel too much uh, of anything exciting unless there's inflammation or enlargement or something like that, but that's where it's located. And it produces hormones, which are chemicals that go into the bloodstream and travel through the body to go do things. Uh, thyroid activity is regulated by the brain. The brain sends signals um, to the thyroid to tell it what to do. There are a couple of different signaling molecules involved in a couple of specific parts of the brain, uh, the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, but we'll collectively refer to it as just the brain for the sake of today's conversation so we don't get too confusing because there's a lot of words involved and I can stumble over them. Um, TSH is that main hormone that's released from the brain. T4 
to the thyroid to tell the thyroid what to do. And its job is to produce T3 and T4, which are the two thyroid hormones. Ordinarily, if the thyroid needs to work harder or if it's under-functioning, the brain will send a stronger signal to the thyroid in order to try to get it to pick up the pace. Think about it like a, an angry boss yelling at a worker, trying to get them to work harder. If the thyroid's not doing their job, then the brain, the boss has to kind of yell at the thyroid to try to stimulate further production of T3 and T4. The same thing is true on the other hand is if the thyroid is over-functioning, too much T3 and T4 are getting released into the bloodstream, the brain will recognize that and down-regulate its signaling. So it'll send a smaller and smaller TSH signal, hoping to reduce the amount of thyroid hormone being produced. It's really important that those thyroid hormone levels are well-regulated because those thyroid hormones do so many different things in the body. There's a very narrow range of normal and anything outside of that can be really dangerous. We'll talk about what some of those issues might be in just a minute here. T3 and T4 are those two thyroid hormones. Um, they are named as such because they structurally consist of three or four molecules of iodine attached to some proteins and, and other uh, molecules. Um, T3, triiodothyronine, is three molecules of iodine attached to some proteins. T4, or tetraiodothyronine, is four molecules of iodine attached to some proteins. T4 can be converted into T3 by taking off one of those molecules of iodine, which makes T4 a really nice storage reservoir for T3. So T3 is actually like the main thyroid hormone that we think about in terms of what it does in the body. It brings about most of those thyroid related effects. It's the most active hormone between the two of them, but only 20% of total thyroid hormone actually is T3. The other 80% is T4, and that's because T4 primarily acts as a storage for T3. So you have a bunch of T4, and when you need more T3 in a moment's notice, you just chop off one of those iodine molecules, and now you have more T3. <clears throat> How do those thyroid hormones travel in the body? So sometimes they travel just in the bloodstream on their own. That's when they're interacting with cells. Um, but they also are carried by proteins. We call them carrier proteins called thyroglobulins, which are manufactured by the liver. Think about these proteins as city buses and your bloodstream um, or your blood vessels are like roads. And these city buses travel on the roads carrying these thyroid hormones. Think about those like the people on the bus. When they get to their destination, the thyroid hormones get off the bus, they go to the cell or go into the building and do what those thyroid hormones are supposed to do. This is another form of reservoir for hormones. So most of the hormone that's produced is actually bound to these proteins. Then a very small amount gets off the city bus or unbinds from the protein to go interact with the cell and bring about the thyroid related activities. Um, so there's lots of backup to make sure that we have thyroid hormones at the levels that they need to be in the bloodstream at all times. Once they reach their destination, they get off the bus, they start interacting with the cell, um, they engage in regulatory processes related to metabolism. So we normally talk about metabolism as energy usage, energy expenditure, body weight, you know, how much energy you burn through or food you might burn through. And that's true. That is part of metabolism. Um, but the thyroid also regulates body temperature, growth and development. So babies in utero, as well as adults, skin, hair, nails, anytime there is cellular turnover and production of new cells, skin cells, for example, um, the thyroid is going to regulate that. Digestion is also regulated by the thyroid health fast or slow, the digestive processes are moving along, heart rate and cardiovascular function, blood pressure, fertility, sometimes mental health um, is related to the thyroid. So it's really important. It really touches on every other system of the body, um, which is why functional medicine can be so fundamental. Because if you were seeing, let's say a cardiologist and you had a heart disorder and you were seeing a GI specialist for some GI symptoms, those doctors might not talk to each other, but through the relationship with your thyroid and some other systems of the body, like your gut and your heart are connected to each other. So in functional medicine, we try to connect those dots and fill in those gaps to make sure that we understand what is this web of interactions occurring in the body and where is the true root cause of a person's problems. 
some other notes here about the thyroid, about 12% of the U.S. population will develop a thyroid-related condition in their lifetime. So unfortunately, these are very common disorders. Um, overwhelmingly, women are much more likely than men to develop them. They're up to eight times more likely to develop thyroid-related disorders. Um, and actually, 60% of the population is estimated to not be aware that they have a thyroid-related condition, or rather 60% of people who have thyroid conditions don't know about it yet. And that begs the importance of testing, right? Um, you don't know that it's your thyroid unless you test your thyroid. Um, and that's what we do in functional medicine. So let's talk specifically about um, the two different ways that the thyroid can fall out of balance. Um, one is by overactivity. We call that hyperthyroidism. We'll start there. There's also underactivity, hypothyroidism. We'll get to that next. But hyperthyroidism, that word hyper means too much, excessive, and then related to the thyroid. What can cause hyperthyroidism or overactivity of the thyroid gland? Um, lots of different things. Sometimes use of certain medications like amiodarone or psychotropic medications, chemotherapy drugs. Uh, other things that can damage the thyroid could be from autoimmune disorders, which is where your body attacks itself exposure to environmental toxins like nitrates in food, PCBs and plastic chemicals, oxybenzone, which is one of the major chemicals found in over-the-counter sunscreens is actually very damaging to the thyroid. Lead exposure um, and other heavy metals can also do that as well as excessive iodine intake can actually damage the thyroid. Um, and when the thyroid is overactive, that manifests as excessive type of symptoms. Like all the systems of the body are sort of functioning at a higher level than they need to be. So that could be anxiety or irritability in terms of um, a person's mental health, hyperactivity or nervous energy, mood swings, sometimes difficulty falling asleep and insomnia, feeling too hot or really intolerant of heat, diarrhea if the GI system is overactive, fertility problems, people might feel extremely thirsty, um, their heart rate might go up significantly, blood pressure could go up, eye problems can develop, weight, list, excuse me, weight loss is common or hair loss. Um, now what's important to know about some of these things is they're not specific to the thyroid. Um, these are other systems of the body that the thyroid regulates. So you could have mood swings or diarrhea for lots of different reasons. So it's really important to understand, hey, what is the main underlying cause of this? Some specific conditions that can cause hyperthyroidism. So Graves disease is the autoimmune cause of hyperthyroidism. Um, this is actually an immune disorder where the immune system starts attacking certain parts of the thyroid, um, leading to excessive stimulation of the receptors, which then leads the thyroid to produce too much T3 and T4. Um, that's a problem because it can manifest as those symptoms, but it actually, there runs the risk of what's called a thyroid storm, which is when those thyroid hormone levels spike up way too quickly for too long. And it actually can have some really damaging cardiovascular implications like heart attack um, can develop because of a thyroid problem. So having too much thyroid hormone really is dangerous. Um, this is diagnosed by a specific antibody test um, called TSI, which diagnoses the autoimmune piece of the hyperthyroidism. So hyperthyroidism on a normal blood test is usually diagnosed by two high levels of T3 and T4, but you know it's Graves if you have that TSI blood test. Addressing Graves disease through functional medicine, obviously we want to normalize the thyroid's production of hormones, but we also want to address that underlying root cause. So it's not just a hyperthyroid patient, it's there's a Graves disease issue, there's an autoimmune issue, we wanna figure out what is driving that autoimmune process and that inflammation that results from the immune system attacking part of the body, which frankly, that should never happen. You should never make antibodies against yourself because you yourself are not a foreign invader. Uh, so we look at those sorts of things. We can use nutraceuticals and herbal strategies, herbal medicines, excuse me, medicines in order to tone down that immune reactivity, also to modulate how thyroid hormone is being produced and to support the body in terms of the other effects that can develop as a result of having excess thyroid hormone production. Classically in the traditional medical model, um, a prescription for methimazole or certain other medications that are actually that kill the thyroid tissue at a low level and suppress it are typically prescribed. Sometimes other cardiac medications um, because of the cardiac effects of hyperthyroidism would be prescribed. We try to take more of like a root cause approach rather than needing to suppress the thyroid. We say, hey, let's suppress the immune system. 
not so much suppressing it though, more like bringing it back into balance. That's sort of the difference there between functional medicine and the traditional medical model. Another reason that someone might have hyperthyroidism is because of thyroid nodules that are metabolically active. So thyroid nodules are small, hard lumps that are in the thyroid that are different from the surrounding tissue. Think about it like scar tissue or a callus that can form. Um, it's still skin, but it feels different and acts different than the rest of your skin. A thyroid nodule feels different, acts different than the rest of the thyroid tissue. Not all thyroid nodules produce thyroid hormone, but some of them do. And they end up producing too much thyroid hormone or they produce it in a way that is more difficult for the brain to regulate. These are diagnosed by a physical exam. Sometimes you can feel them when you're palpating or feeling your thyroid um, or more specifically by an ultrasound, which measures them and tracks them over time. Uh, the traditional medical model for these sorts of metabolically active nodules would be either watch and see, um, see if they reach the point that we need to remove them or surgical removal of them. Sometimes medications are given to um, to slow down thyroid production of hormones similar to Graves' disease. Other times there's a recommendation to use radioactive iodine, which kills the thyroid um, in, in a, a situation where it can't be controlled. Obviously we want to avoid situations like that. So in functional medicine, we try to figure out what is the cause of those thyroid nodules. Thyroid nodules being similar to scar tissue often develop in response to tissue injury. So not necessarily physical damage, but if there's inflammation, um, that's going to essentially create a wound or a bleeding in the thyroid that then will result in the immune system developing this scar tissue or this different tissue from the rest of the thyroid gland. Uh, we also focus on reducing inflammation from other sources uh, in addition to just the immune uh, effects. And then we want to mitigate recurrence of those thyroid nodules or prevent additional ones from growing. So for example, there are certain herbal supplements and nutritional supplements that we can use to prevent thyroid nodule formation, selenium being one of them. There's research that shows that using selenium for a period of nine months can reduce the formation of new thyroid nodules. Um, but it's also runs the risk of selenium toxicity. So you have to be monitored if you're going to be doing a therapy like that. Thyroiditis refers to inflammation of the thyroid. So inflammation of the thyroid can be caused by many different things. Sometimes viruses, hormonal shifts, such as those that we see in pregnancy and childbirth um, or other times in life like puberty and menopause, um, exposure to certain chemical toxins, sometimes drug use or drug exposures, they can cause inflammation, which is a low-grade swelling of the thyroid that alters how it responds to signaling from the brain. And that can result in overproduction of thyroid hormone. So of course, in functional medicine, our goal is to reduce that inflammation. Now, something that I want to differentiate here is sometimes inflammation of the thyroid can lead to nodule formation. It does not always. Inflammation of the thyroid on its own can lead to overproduction of thyroid hormone, and those nodules can then also lead to overproduction of thyroid hormone. So they're related issues, uh, not the same though. Um, but we do treat them similarly in functional medicine. We want to figure out what is causing the inflammation in the first place, whether that is an underlying infection um, or an exposure to something. We want to test for those and eliminate them and then track the inflammatory markers through lab testing to make sure that they're improving. We also look at the other hormonal influences over thyroid hormone production. So thyroid hormones travel in the bloodstream other hormones also travel in the bloodstream, like stress hormones and reproductive hormones, and all those hormones talk to each other. And so if there's an imbalance in another area of the body, like the reproductive hormones, for example, those are going to affect your thyroid. And so we want to make sure that we understand those relationships when we're treating something like thyroiditis. Next, we have hypothyroidism. So hypothyroidism is much more common, actually, than hyperthyroidism, though obviously that's a concern too. Um, but it's the the opposite side of the picture. So hypothyroidism is underactivity, slowing down of the thyroid and its related functions. There are two ways that this can develop, or two categories rather. Um, sometimes people are born with hypothyroidism because they are born without a thyroid or because when they were developing in utero, uh, the mom did not have a proper th functioning thyroid. Um, so we call that congenital hypothyroidism. There really is no cure for that. If you don't have a thyroid, you need to take medication to replace that. And so we have thyroid replacement medications or hormone replacement medications that can be used to replace 
thyroid hormone deficiencies. Um, there, then there is what we call primary or idiopathic hypothyroidism, where you have a thyroid and it was functioning at one point, but then it stopped. Uh, and we need to figure out what caused that to stop. And there are many things that can trigger that. Um, there are immune considerations, autoimmune disorders. There's GI factors that can affect the thyroid function exposures to chemicals in the environment or drug use. Um, and I don't mean necessarily illicit drugs, but prescription drugs too. So for example, bromocryptine, which is a fertility medication that's often used, actually can damage the thyroid and lead to hypothyroidism. Chemo drugs, certain cardiovascular drugs, um, metformin can affect the thyroid. Plastics, heavy metals, flame retardants, some of these environmental contaminants, um, which are areas that we need to pay attention to um, in order to understand what it is that's affecting a person's thyroid function. Um, so while hyperthyroid symptoms manifest as overactivity of the different bodily systems, hypothyroidism is the opposite side of that coin. It's everything is slowing down. Things like fatigue, weight gain, cold intolerance, um, joint and muscle pain, dry skin, dry hair, heavy or irregular periods, sometimes fertility problems, low heart rate, low blood pressure, dizziness can result from that. Um, mental and emotional health concerns like depression, any system of the body can be touched by hyper or hypothyroidism. So then when we are talking about causes of hypothyroidism, um, let's circle back to the brain to explain this first one here. So hypothalamic hypothyroidism, Hypothal or excuse me, hypothalamic refers to the hypothalamus, which is a part of the brain. Um, and sometimes what happens is when the body is in a very stressful environment, uh, the brain will make the assessment that it is too wasteful of resources to have a high metabolism. And so it will intentionally downregulate its signaling to the thyroid in an effort to conserve those resources and protect the body. So this is really like a self-protection mechanism, even though it can be really frustrating that your body is sort of creating a new problem in response to a different problem. Um, we call this more of like a stress-induced hypothyroidism because of that environmental stress. And it doesn't have to be psychological stress, though that can have very real measurable effects on thyroid hormone production, but it also can involve stresses on the body from too much or too little exercise, uh, not enough food. So if you've heard of like starvation mode, a very calorie restricted diet can lead to this stress related suppression of thyroid function. Um, not enough sleep can do it. Um, certain infections, sometimes hormonal changes can also bring this about. And we diagnose it by lab testing. In the classic sense, hypothyroidism um, would be manifested on lab results as a high TSH level and low T3 and T4. The thyroid is underproducing T3 and T4, and the brain is yelling at the thyroid to try to get it to pick up the pace. That's actually not the case with this stress-related form of hypothyroidism. It's not a problem with the thyroid, actually. It's a functional disorder where the brain is intentionally turning off the thyroid function. So TSH would actually be low. And in response, T3 and T4 would also be low. Um, the functional medicine approach to treating this is actually just addressing the main cause, which is a stress response in the body. And so we need to dig into those other systems, figure out what is causing that stress, be it, it you know, lifestyle factors or infections, hormones elsewhere in the body and treating those there. Uh, we also will focus pretty heavily on stress management strategies because that obviously is going to serve the patient long-term to be able to prevent recurrence of this problem. The traditional medical model typically doesn't test for this in the early stages. If they run a TSH screen and it's normal, or they run a TSH screen and it uh, doesn't fit a classical pattern, that sometimes they'll diagnose it as euthyroid, and that's typically a watch and wait type of problem. Then there's Hashimoto's disease. So Hashimoto's disease is an autoimmune disorder in which the immune system attacks the thyroid. Um, it's different from Graves' disease because there's a different part of the thyroid that's getting attacked by the immune system. So we have lots of different ways that we can attack our own thyroid. Isn't that lovely? Um, <clears throat> Hashimoto's disease often does, but does not always result in hypothyroidism. So it's its own autoimmune disease. And sometimes it's accompanied by enough destruction of the thyroid to where the thyroid is then unable to produce thyroid hormone. So if your immune system is attacking your thyroid, eventually it's going to damage the thyroid enough to where it's not going to produce thyroid hormone. 
Um, people can have symptoms related to Hashimoto's in two different ways. They can have the hypothyroid related symptoms that we talked about a couple slides ago, or they can have some specific autoimmune type symptoms, which can be fatigue and fevers, um, pain, things like that. So there, it's a much more comprehensive picture than other, some other forms of hypothyroidism. It's also paradoxical because sometimes the initial inflammation caused by the autoimmune reaction st overstimulates the thyroid and it produces too much thyroid hormone for a period before vacillating back into an underactive thyroid state. Um, so Hashimoto's as an autoimmune disease is diagnosed by those antibodies against the thyroid called anti-TPO and anti-TG, which are anti thyroperoxidase and antithyroglobulin antibodies. And if a person has hypothyroidism as a result of that, that would be manifested in imbalances in TSH, T3, and T4. In functional medicine, we approach Hashimoto's disease as an autoimmune disease. So we're looking at autoimmunity, we're looking at the immune system, we're looking at inflammation, and we're looking at the thyroid function. So if there's damage to the thyroid, we need to support the thyroid and repair that. And so we'll use really a wide variety of different strategies to look at how the immune system is influencing the thyroid and what the thyroid then needs to recover from that damage and hopefully regain some of that function. Oftentimes we can regain function, not always. And so oftentimes co-management with um, a provider who would prescribe hormone replacement therapy for T4 called levothyroxine is sometimes required. Um, we also look in to the GI influence over the immune system because the gastrointestinal tract really is like the foundation of the immune system. So that plays a big role in terms of managing something like Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. There also are dietary factors that can be beneficial in managing this as an autoimmune disease. Um, there's really strong research that shows the relationship between following a gluten-free diet and reducing those TPO and TG antibodies. So in functional medicine, we recognize that producing antibodies reflects as damage to the thyroid. So reducing the level of a person's antibodies means that there's a lower level of autoimmune destruction of the thyroid. And we see that as a sign of improvement and a good prognostic factor. So that's one of the things we use to track and manage follow-up for someone who has Hashimoto's disease. Sometimes we catch Hashimoto's at an early stage. Um, the antibody levels are relatively low and that's actually a good thing. We can educate our patients, hey, you have this disorder and let's keep it from progressing to hypothyroidism, which is a more advanced stage. Another way that the um, excuse me that the thyroid can be underactive um, actually relates to how those thyroid hormones T3 and T4 are converted into each other. So uh, several slides ago we were we were discussing how T4 converts into T3 by reducing or excuse me removing one of those molecules of iodine. Um, if there's a problem with the body's ability to do that, oftentimes related to the liver. Um, then you're not going to have enough T3 to do all the T3 related activities in your body. And so that can manifest as hypothyroid symptoms, even though the thyroid is producing everything it needs to produce. It's making T3, it's making T4, but your body for some reason is unable to convert that T4 into T3 when you need it. That reservoir system is defunct. Um, and in order to address that in functional medicine, we end up looking at the liver and those conversion systems more than we're looking at the thyroid because the thyroid isn't the problem, right? Um, so if there's something like a nutritional deficiency that's affecting the enzymes, um, which are proteins that cleave molecules, so an enzyme would be responsible for converting T4 into T3, we would look into those and look at those nutritional components, um, looking at the liver and the GI system because those are also places where those enzymes function. Um, oxidative stress, sometimes chemical inflammation in the body can interfere with that. Unfortunately, peripheral conversion defect, which is what we're referring to when we're talking about that T4 to T3 conversion, gets missed by the traditional medical model because T3 and T4 levels, they are not always out of range and TSH is normal. So in the traditional medical model, if you're getting your thyroid checked for like your annual wellness exam, they typically will only do TSH levels. And TSH is often normal in an issue like peripheral conversion defect. It's just the symptoms meet that hypothyroid pattern, which is what prompts us in functional medicine to dig deeper and figure out where in that thyroid pattern are things running amok. There's also an issue with thyroid hormones out in the periphery of the body uh, called hormone receptor competition. And this is really a environment, excuse me, an environmental exposure issue. If you get 
exposed to toxins or drugs that look similar to thyroid hormone. They actually can block their the activity of thyroid hormone even when your thyroid is functioning perfectly normally. Um, so here's an example or or an illustration of how that works. Think about thyroid hormones like the key to the engine of your car. Um, you know, when they fit into the cell, they fit into that ignition, turn the key, rev the engine, bring about those thyroid related activities. Well, if something is plugging your keyhole in your car, the thyroid molecule or your key is not going to be able to fit in there and do what it's supposed to do. So that's what we would be referring to as hormone receptor competition. Something's in the receptor where the thyroid hormone would fit on the cells. And that can be things like the PCBs and plastics or the other environmental contaminants we touched on earlier. In those cases, we need to cleanse the body of those contaminants as much as we can and reduce ongoing exposure. Binding globulin availability. So <clears throat> this is more of a liver inflammation disorder. Think about those city buses we were talking about earlier, those thyroglobulins, proteins that carry thyroid hormones through the bloodstream. If there are too many city buses on the road, um, then everybody's going to be on the city bus. Work with me here. Um, if, if there's too many city buses or too many proteins, they will grab onto those, pro those thyroid hormones and not release them. And then even though you have enough thyroid hormones in your bloodstream, they're not available to get off the bus and go into the building and do their job, right? So that's a problem if everybody is staying in their vehicle. Um, and that would be because the, the liver is overproducing these proteins and they go and stick to the thyroid hormones. This is often caused by use of hormonal contraceptives like the birth control pill, um, which is why partly some of those hormonal contraceptives can lead to problems like weight gain or other uh, symptoms that are classically hypothyroid symptoms. Um, so we need to remove the triggering event and then support the liver uh, in its ability to normalize its thyroglobulin production. Nutrient deficiencies can also cause hypothyroidism. So T3 and T4 are three and four molecules of iodine bound to some proteins. If you don't have enough iodine, you can't make T3 and T4. Um, but there are other nutrients involved that uh, participate in manufacturing of thyroid hormone, whether structurally of the hormone themselves or the thyroid uses them in order to produce those thyroid hormones. So things like selenium, zinc, B vitamins. Interestingly, worldwide, uh, iodine deficiency hypothyroidism is actually the number one cause of hypothyroidism. Uh, it's not classically tested for in the US though, because I think we take for granted that people have enough of what they need. Um, and a fun fact for you actually that um, with iodized salt, that was a big public health initiative to try to correct iodine deficiency in the US and prevent that from occurring. So they just said, hey, everybody eats salt, let's put iodine in the salt that people eat the table salt. But iodine is a volatile, or a volatile molecule. So when you open your salt container, it evaporates off. So you know, there's some questions about how just how effective that is um, and some other concerns about whether we should be supplementing everybody with iodine because excess iodine is a problem too. But um, there's your trivia fact for the day about iodine deficiency. All right, to sum things up, hyper and hypothyroidism are both common, unfortunately, thyroid disorders. Um, they're opposite from each other. One is overactivity of the thyroid. That would be hyperthyroidism, whereas hypothyroidism is underactivity, and both can be caused by many different things. So sometimes it's the thyroid that's the problem, and sometimes it's not the thyroid's problem at all. It's something else that's affecting its ability to function or affecting the function of those thyroid hormones out in the bloodstream. And in functional medicine, we really try to figure out what that root cause is so that we can identify it early, prevent the problems from progressing and help people get better faster without needing to rely on drugs or surgery um, that would otherwise be unnecessary. So um, now we are moving into a time for questions and answers. Thank you so much for joining today. Um, if you have any questions, I would encourage you to type them into that Q&A feature. Um, but if you have anything specific for your own health, uh, we're here for you for that too. So we offer 15 minute consults if you wanted to talk with somebody about some concerns you have and see if functional medicine is right for you. And to do that, you can call the number on the screen or you can visit us at alignmodernhealth.com. All right, I'm gonna take a look here at some of the questions. Um, so somebody was asking for clarification about the dietary restrictions that may be helpful in some cases for Hashimoto's and that would be a gluten-free diet, but there are other dietary factors that can be beneficial as well, like supplementing certain nutrients in a person's diet. Um, Omega-3s can also be really beneficial. Somebody else asked, 
through nutrition and a gluten-free diet, can Hashimoto's be cured? That's actually a really great, great question and one that we get often. Um, Hashimoto's isn't something you can cure per se. And here's what I mean by that. If you have an autoimmune disorder, that means that you had a genetic predisposition to developing that autoimmune disorder. And once you have it, you have it. However, it can be managed, meaning we can control the immune response and reduce the inflammation that is produced as a consequence of that autoimmunity. So a person with Hashimoto's can be in remission, but they're always going to have Hashimoto's. Somebody else is asking, um, what is a good score for antibodies with someone with Hashimoto's? So <clears throat> that's a, a complex question, but also one that I often receive. So the cutoff for what is counting as Hashimoto is from a laboratory diagnostic standpoint, technically depends on the lab, but in the labs that we run, it, the cutoff is 60. Um, something that I'll talk to my patients about is that it's never normal to have any level of antibodies against yourself. So it should be zero. Zero is normal. That's good. Um, if it's between zero and 60, that's telling us that you probably have that genetic predisposition, that low level simmering autoimmunity. If it spikes above 60, that's a problem and your thyroid is at risk. So we really need to take initiative at that point. I see patients all across the board who come in who have Hashimoto's and their numbers are in the hundreds or the thousands. Um, and oftentimes in the traditional medical model, they will not do anything about Hashimoto's antibodies until your levels reach like 10,000, um, which is unfortunate because once you're there, you've got a lot more work to do. Somebody else is asking here about specific foods to increase iodine intake. So really the only natural food sources of iodine come from seaweed and algae in the ocean, which fish eat. And then um, you can get it that way from eating fish or the food that fish eat, seaweed, algae, um, and fish from salt water sources. Somebody else is asking, are there things we can do to avoid developing an autoimmune disorder, best practices and lifestyle tips? Um, you want to make sure that the foundational elements of your health are in place, right? So with autoimmunity, genetics, load the gun, environment pulls the trigger is the, the adage that's used. So you want to make sure that your environment is set up well, that you don't have exposures to chemicals that um, could be harming you, that you're sleeping enough, eating well, correcting any um, underlying health issues that you have. And that requires testing and diligence and making sure that you have a full full and thorough checkup, um, sometimes more, more thorough than is just performed at a, a basic wellness screen when you see your primary care doctor. So someone is asking here, is there a connection between thyroid conditions and other hormonal conditions such as PCOS or endometriosis? Um, yes, absolutely. So I touched on this briefly that the different hormonal systems of your body uh, interrelate with each other. And I like to use a um, an example of like a triangle. So if you have uh, three points of a triangle up at the top is your thyroid, and then you'll have your reproductive hormones over here in this corner and your adrenal hormones over here in this corner. If there is an imbalance in one system of the body like this, it's going to change the angles everywhere else in the triangle. All of those are related to each other because of the relationship between those thyroid binding proteins or reproductive hormone binding proteins because of your brain at the center, regulating all of those different processes in the body because progesterone, for example, which is a reproductive hormone, increases thyroid hormone production. So if you don't have enough progesterone, it's going to affect your thyroid. Same thing with cortisol. It's a stress hormone. It increases thyroid hormone production and then decreases it at a later time. There's a very strong relationship there. That's why in functional medicine, we're always looking at the whole picture to figure out what else is affecting those thyroid markers. Um, someone is asking here about preventative care when you have a family history. So yes, it's similar to making sure that you have um, your own foundational elements in place. But I really, really encourage you, if you have a family history, go get tested, even if you don't necessarily have um, thyroid-related symptoms. Um, if you have a family history of an autoimmune disease, you want to know that and take steps that you any steps that you can to mitigate progression of that. All right. Um, I think we're running out of time here and we have a lot of questions. So I, I, unfortunately we can't get to all of them, but I would really encourage you to make a consult if you can. Um, and we will try to get back to you um, as soon as we can about some of those other questions. So thank you guys so much for joining here today. It was a pleasure talking about this subject, uh, an important one. And um, I wish you all a healthy and happy rest of your, your January. <laughs>